I got hot, hot coffee. You're listening to the iRacers Lounge podcast, where we discuss everything iRacing in a casual setting. Enjoy. Three, two, welcome to the iRacers Lounge. I am your host, Mike Ellis. iRacers Lounge is a podcast for the iRacer where we talk all things iRacing in a casual setting. Joining me are the usual characters, David Hall. I am pleased to report I have survived my 490th end of the world. All right, Brad Wren. Hey, everybody. John Curley. Hey, I racers. No Martinsville this week. All right. And Justin Pearson. <laughs> what up, my friend? Welcome. And Greg Hectus. What's up, everybody? On today's show, we'll get a sneak peek into iRacing's NASCAR 25 console games brainstorming session. Find out if the Martinsville races were any better than Richmond. Share with you... To- how and how to take a deep dive into your iRacing stats, review some exciting hardware, and if you like rain, iRacing has a new series just for you. That's right, and remember that you can follow along with us on your PC or your mobile device in real time as you listen to the show and see for yourself all of the great topics and products we'll discuss by visiting iRacersLounge.com and selecting the show notes. We hope to see you there. All right, we're actually going to jump a little bit away from iRacing and talk console game, Mike. First up, Steve Myers has been talking about NASCAR 25. Yeah, he put out an a inside peek at the team having a co- conference call with none other than Dale Jr. holding court, uh, giving, him, uh, giving those team a lot of uh, leading-edge ideas uh, for this console game. He also even showed a screenshot of his computer monitor with uh, not only the the webcam faces, but uh, some renderings of what the car may look like from the inside here. Um, What do you guys think? There's a a subsequent tweet, if you scroll down, where one of... uh, the guy on Twitter called, I just shat myself. <laughs> he put up uh, a, a blow up of what was on Steve Meyer's screen. And, and here's the notes that were taken from the meeting. Um, I think this is the flow of what happens when you go to get into the car. So it says, now inside the car again, my choices are to start qualifying or go to the crew chief screen. I select start qualifying. My crew chief walks away from the car and my crew chief puts the window net up. My driver fires up the car and puts the car in gear. My driver revs the car and drives it off pit road. I see the goal information on the screen. Once the car approaches the end of pit road, the player is given control of the car. So kind of like what you see before, uh, you know, you actually take control of the race. Well, a, go ahead, John. Well, I was just going to say, it, you know, it adds more realism to it. I don't know, you know, in the PC version of the game, if we want to take the time to do that, but I think it might be pretty cool in the console version. I think it's not realism, realism that it's adding. It's adding immersion in fantasy into it more. Um, whereas we'll drive our, we, I mean, we will just drive ourselves to pit road, right? I think I would rather have time invested in something else in the game than that. I, it's interesting, but I, th- I think you're having trouble getting us excited for it because we do the sim, right? This is going to be great as a gateway, but for me personally, I probably won't get it. 
me neither. I won't be buying it. So obvious reasons. There was a tweet last week, I guess, where they said what fall of twenty five. I thought this was originally supposed to be some towards where the beginning of twenty five. Yeah, there was even a subsequent uh, tweet from Steve that said something along the lines of, if we do everything on the list from that meeting, you know, it'll never come out kind of thing. (laughs) There's too many good ideas. I saw Carson Hosevar commented in there, too. He said, how about you add loose wheels and pit stop and tire issues? He says that might be a cool addition. But again, that's, I don't think we want that in iRacing. Well, I think there's different goals. I mean, when we go to race, you know, we're pulling off pit road ourselves. You know, we don't need, you know, uh, to be handheld into it. When you're, when you're on a console in your living room and you have a PlayStation controller or Xbox controller, it's a little different. I think, I, I, I don't think you're not trying to go for that immersion. You're just trying, okay, just throw me into the race. You know, I want to be up to speed. I don't want to be doing pace laps, you know, that kind of thing. Has anybody here ever, I guess, played the, what is it, the World of Outlaws game they did? Is that similar? I don't, I get, I'm not a console guy, so I don't know. Yeah, me neither. Well, it'll be interesting. All right, this next topic is pretty interesting. Um, This happens actually sometimes in sports car racing, believe it or not, as well. Uh, Sean Peleg shared on X that the drivers from the Sunday NIS top split, after getting frustrated with the constant restart cautions, agreed to start single file. And the entire field apparently uh, cooperated. Wait, this is an official race? It was NIS. Wow. I'm not sure I'd blame them. <laughs> That's kind of cool. I mean, respect. Oh, wait. I mean, there's always that one guy in the lobby that's not going to go along with it, you know. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised that everybody went along with it. I guess you didn't have a choice. Like, if you were back in 20th, you still have to line up behind the guy that was kind of in front of you right i mean even if it is single file in front of you it's not like you can just drive around everybody you know to try to do a dual restart dual file restart i wonder how long that line was because that stretched them way out well look if i was at the back and 30th or back i would be i'd have a problem with this because it like you just said it's going to put you almost a lap down right off the bat um, I don't know how, if that's fair, considering the rules of the the lobby are, you know, double file restart. Well, everybody agreed, so it was fair. Uh, and they had a long green flag run afterwards. Uh, cool idea. Now, we do the at uh, Le Mans, of often they will agree to do a single file restart through the chicane because you're not going to be restarting constantly, right? Uh, so they'd rather everybody just get past the forge of cane and then go towards turn one. I'm curious uh, how many yellows they had to lead up to this. I probably should have gone and found the, uh, found the split to see. Well, and there's no context to say, did it help the racing? Did it go right back to caution, you know, like uh, usual, or did it fix the problem? You weren't listening. I did say, they had a long green flag run afterwards. Oh, you did? Okay. I didn't read that here. Yeah, so Jacob sent this in, I guess, to iRacing in the replay, so see if maybe they'll throw it in one of the uh, top tens. It must have been in the replies. I read read somewhere in there that it it ran long. Uh, Yeah, so they, uh, they all agreed, try a single file restart. It actually worked. Uh, to get the longest green run of the night. All right, we can move on. Let's talk data, John. Yeah, there's a website called iRacingData.com where you can look up some pretty cool statistics on iRacing. You know, you can uh, look up 
gosh, I mean, all kinds of things you can series popularity, I rating distribution, I rating per club, series safety, series lap times. I mean, if you if you want to get in, if you're a statistics guy, you know, I like baseball, so I like statistics. Some of this stuff's pretty cool. If you if you want to know, for example, I'm new to this. What series can I get into where it's safer than others? This will tell you. Well, I like, um, on the other hand as well, John, the where uh, the profile page where you type in your um, ID number. And, of course, I have mine memorized, so I typed it in. And one, you know, it gives you stats that you can find at iRacing. However, they uh, they rank them in, hey, uh, as far as I rating, uh, iRacing starts, I'm in the top 1% on Oval of, in the service. As far as my win count, I'm actually in the top 3% on win count. Laps led, I'm actually in the top 1% on laps led. Yeah, it's pretty neat to to get yourself ranked, you know, percentiles. Um, just another way to to kind of look at stuff. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's you could spend quite a bit of time just digging into it here. It's pretty neat. And I notice on the home page they've given four drivers a quick link to Max for Stappen, Jimmy Broadbent, Dale Jr., Tony Kanon. So if you want to see what the pros do, uh, their names are on there. You just click on it, you can see it. Yeah, Max on road, his uh, top 1% for wins, top 1% for starts per win, top 1% for laps led. And he doesn't have any starts under the new sports car license, um, zero so far, and the formula. Now, I do wonder how accurate that is because it's you know like if you click on tony canon it says he's only got 167 i racing starts but you know we're going to talk about a video a little bit later in the show where he said he races pretty much every day so i don't that can't be right if he's racing every day he started more than 167 times they hosted maybe yeah this is official numbers i think so he does a lot of hosted I don't know. You're. I mean, I have to agree with you about the accuracy here, John, because you would think that Tony has had an official start since the new licenses have come out, and I don't see any starts for him under the new licenses. So who knows? Pretty cool. It's iRacingData.com. All right, next we have a tweet, Justin, from RFK Racing. Yeah, uh, RFK Racing says on their tweet, only two, or has a tweet, says only two choices in R- RFK Racing stem, and it's, and it's a picture of their um, stem rig, and it's got two shortcut menus on Windows here, uh, NASCAR Racing Sim, so I assume theirs, then iRacing itself. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, so you got NASCAR Racing 2003, which is the predecessor to tire racing. So not sure if they're firing up in R2003 very often. You get a little uh, glance at the equipment they are, they're using, some of it. You can see a, a Max Pappas Industries wheel um, like Brad has. Uh, it's got a little uh, push-to-talk button. Uh, and then it looks kind of like the Derek Spears designs uh, button boxes going off either side of a semi cube two. Those are definitely Derek Spears. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a few videos around I've seen. I think a busher, you know, turning laps. It's been a while since I've seen them, but you can you can find some out there. But that's pretty neat. Is that your radio button, Brad? Uh, no, no. I think that's. Uh, Gosh, I've seen that one somewhere, and I'm trying to think where that one was at because maybe a Rick Motec. I think that's a Rick Motec button. I looked at that one originally, but uh, it's just a single button. The one I ended up getting off at, so he's got you know, actually two push buttons and two toggle switches. Well, 
Well, Brad, was it really that bad? Well, we discussed Richmond quite a bit last week um, about the the amount of laps under yellow, and I think we had a had a post from somebody that the I guess it was one of the one of the, the Richmond races. I guess had the most caution, most most laps under caution uh, in the in the history. I guess maybe NIS. I'm trying to remember, but so Matt O'Brien had a uh, post uh, says uh, showing that the A uh, so Apex had 67.91% of the laps run under caution at Martinsville. So this, this comes out as the, as the fifth worst Apex week ever. Um, but interesting is you start to go down through and look at this. It's, it's quite staggering exactly how horrible the racing was at Martinsville. Um, you know, from Apex, 60, almost 68% of the laps look were under yellow. Apex. Yeah, C fixed seventy eight point five nine. How is that even possible? Seventy eight percent. It's quite horrible. Um, you know, B open forty eight percent. I said before, some of the best racing I've done has been in B open, and uh, you know, yeah, seventy seventy eight percent A open again fifty two. Um, but even in the open sets, um, just you know, it's 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 a mess. I mean, we all talked about Martinsville, or we will talk about it, but I mean, it was just it was two two weeks of just madness, nothing but yellows, um, just not a lot of fun. It's kind of the same, you know, crap attitude that the NASCAR has right now about the two short tracks and how the racing went and everybody's, you know, shitting on NASCAR for the package. And Well, in real NASCAR at Martinsville, you couldn't get to anybody. We we obviously at Martinsville in the sim couldn't get away from anybody. Yeah, good point. We were running over each other, get you know, so reckon. Which is again, it's frustrating. I mean, we I've said before, with the right group of guys, you can have some fantastic racing at Martinsville. There's no reason to run each other over. Um Again, it's just it's racecraft and it's everything else we talked about for the last few weeks. So, do, what do you? I mean, what's the fix for this problem? I mean, I you know, I guess you got to look at what the problems are, what's causing it. But and there's got to be a way that the community can figure this out. Well, I saw some, I guess, some forum posts about you know the incident limits and. They were put in place to hopefully cure this, but obviously that's not working. I don't think incident limits are really the the way to handle it. Um, I, I don't know. Um, again, I still think that when they introduced Fast Track is, is when things really went sideways. And you had to spend 13 weeks or 12 weeks in a class to earn your license and work your way up. Uh, I think the race craft ended up being much better. Not just that in the class where you had to run short tracks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you start rookie, and then you, you had to work your way up rookie, D, C, and so forth. But it's just you're building. Um, you know, nobody takes a an eighteen year old and throws them at Talladega. I mean, you 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 know, it's just it. I, I don't know. I understand the purpose for fast track, but I definitely think that that the series that this the service suffers because of it. So, look. When, if you ask an NASCAR fan, when was Martinsville good? When is the last time you remember Martinsville being good? Oh, Dale Jr.'s last win. He was a Gen 6 car. Nobody can complain about the racing at Martinsville back then, right? Now, how was I racing at Martinsville back then, five, six years ago? It was not much different, John, than it is today. Um, you know, Brad says 67%. I would say we probably were at 60% five or six years ago on the caution count. So it's, is there something to fix? No, it's just the way Martinsville is. We expect it. it that's what it, it is, what it is. Yeah. It's, but it's, it's a critical mass of drivers that just, you can't snap your button because there's a few bad apples, but this one, this just, this is not a few bad apples case. Everybody just starts, getting out of their head, running too hard because they think they're only going to get three laps to make it pass anyway. So, and then there's the result. They, they end up practicing the race where I did manage to get the re, the result. I really, and they've talked about, you almost have to do how they almost have to do this in real life now too, is you just try to be the guy who doesn't make the mistakes and doesn't take the chances. 
and let the and and you just have to wait on them to fall around you. Yeah, but I mean, look at the end of the day, the, the blame falls back on us. We're the guys with the wheels. I mean, that's what it comes down to, and it's never going to fix itself until guys take it serious and 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 just think about somebody else on the track, as opposed to just again just throwing it in there. Um, I mean, it's the, the the one race I was in that finished second it was great. I, I was happy for the finish, but the entire race is just nothing but you're an idiot and you're an idiot. And why are you driving like that? Well, I'm not driving bad. And it's just, it it just gets old. Oh, there's nothing the drivers can do because they're with the whole, the whole system is set up where there's no judgment at all. And on any of the calls. So we're just, you know, we, we can't take somebody who's just an idiot and do something about them. Look, it's not just the guys that are, you know, gung ho. It's it's people like me. I contributed. I caused a caution. I I I think I was third on a late restart, going for a win. I was on the inside, and I spun myself out down to the inside and brought out the caution. Nobody hit me. It was my own fault. But but I'm out there being serious about it. I'm out there trying to win the race. I'm out there not you know dive bombing people. That's not what what happened, but I still brought out a caution. So you can have good drivers bringing out cautions in addition to all the bet, all the eggheads and stuff too. And I think that's why you get these huge numbers. Well, we can uh, stop beating that dead horse and talk about a new partnership, Mike. Yeah, this just came out. Um, we got a, a press release from iRacing that they've started a partnership with Universal Technical Institute, UTI um, and Institute, and uh, in Mooresville, North Carolina. Um, and so here's the quote. Incorporating iRacing into our NASCAR program has been a game changer because students apply their theoretical knowledge for something they can feel. The quality of the simulation is impressive and allows our students to understand vehicle adjustments and how the cars handle on the racetrack within a virtual environment, said Scott Kazura, instructor and technical team lead. So this is one of those colleges that you can attend to get an inside track into NASCAR, basically. You know, they it's kind of a hands-on um, school. I, I actually know a guy, I think, who... Um, for on Facebook, uh, Brian something that w- went to this, and he ended up a, as a, on a crew with NASCAR for a few years. I just have to ask with the, with their initials, do they have extra bathrooms? UTI. Stop it. <laughs> well, you know there there was a quote in here. One of the guys that I think worked for Penske. He said, using iRacing allowed me to understand how adjustments from tire pressure to shocks adjust the car on the track. And if you think about that, I mean, these guys that do the work in the shop, they don't get to go out and drive the cars, at least to my knowledge, not much. And so this is a way for them to understand if I make this change on the car, here's how it's going to feel to the driver. So I think it's a, a great concept. Look, motorsports lives in the world of simulation now. Um, it, it doesn't matter what series it is. It, it's all about simulation. Um, on the NASCAR side, there, there's no testing anymore. So you do all your work ahead of time. And for the most part, you either come off the trailer quick or you don't. Um, the days of getting to the track and changing springs and shocks and all that stuff, it's gone. I mean, you roll off the truck, you basically got what you got. So all that work is done in the sim ahead of time. Um, so. Yeah. So did uh, did NASCAR really save him money then by cutting testing? No, no, no. never. No, I, look, I, look, look, stepping off my soapbox. <laughs> I'm trying to push you up on it. I know you are. We'll get to the racing in a little bit. <laughs> All right. Well, we got a video, John. Uh, tell us a little bit about this new iRacing 101 video. Yeah, iRacing, uh, they call it iRacing 101. Each week, what they're going to do is go th- through some of the features of iRacing, uh, you know, and they're going to highlight the features in some of the top series and forms of racing. 
uh, win your race. And so, you know, they've got one out, I think, called or that deals with the ranked racing, what it is, unranked racing. So, yeah, pretty excuse cool. me for calling it a video. It's actually just an article, isn't it? Or article, yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's just an article. But, but again, this is something even a year and a half ago when I started, we didn't really have. So, good tutorials. If you're new to iRacing, please read this stuff. It's going to help you and the people around you. When you're in the beta UI, is it real easy to tell what's ranked and unranked? I don't know. Visually, I can. I've seen the difference. Well, it's official. I mean, that's that's probably a better. I oh, mean, okay. Official so you it, can't find the uh, you can't find those races in the official. Is what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, when you go to the UI, there's hosted and there's official. So it would help probably if we would kind of get the. Well, no, because I guess in the and, official. yeah, but even unranked. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm an A class driver and I go run a B class race, it doesn't help me in my license. I, I, it it would be an unranked race for me, correct? No, it, it would so count. few of them. Count. Well, there's so few of them. I, I think they just throw them in with the official. I mean, and I think it. You know, up until this point of this article, you know, you just kind of knew which ones they were based. I don't know how we knew it, but. Anyway, it's Carburetor Cup, Delara Dash, and Pickup Cup. That's it. So yes. memorize them. <laughs> yeah, so this doesn't even have anything to do with hosted. Just strictly the, I guess, official series that are unranked. Well, when if you search up Delara Dash in the official section, it shows up, but it says right there, license group rookie, and then right next to it, it says unranked. So it, it, it tells okay. you on the big card whether they're ranked or unranked. Can't you use the filter button and it won't separate it? Yeah, but I don't think it holds it when you go back in the UI. Or do they fix that? I don't know because I never run the unranked. Uh, and I, I most of the time have the star filter done. Because I'm just. I, I just occasionally like the pickup run. cup at Phoenix. Uh, boy, that truck is loose. I think most of our guys will know the difference, but uh, yeah, it's good to have that article on there. All right, what do we have next? We have a 2024 Porsche Tag Heuer Sports Super Cup final. And what I run this one over for us, Brad? Yep. So we had the last race um, of the series at, at Monza, um, and in it, so Pinto finds the victory, uh, but Job takes the title. So Sebastian Job, Job, however you want to say it, um, ends up winning the title for the uh, the East the Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup Championship. Uh, feature race was won by Jordan Caruso. Uh, else on podium was Chris Lutham and Alejandro Sanchez. And in the Super Cup feature race number two, uh, like I said, Pinto won it. Uh, Cooper Webster was second, and Chris uh, Luham was third. Um, but at the end of the day, and you know, we've talked about Sebastian the whole year, uh, really got out to a good start, ended up with uh, 469 points over Diego uh, Pinto, 451, and Jordan Caruso at 332. So really the top two guys were just way out ahead of everybody else, but it looked like to be a pretty good fight there from on back. Uh, the next four guys were all within, it's like 11 points of each other. So um, and I've said before, at some point I need to watch these because they they seem to be pretty good races. But uh, another uh, eSport championship in the books. Pretty exciting to see him uh, at the checkered flag. The relief just pour out of this guy's face. He looks tense, very tense. You can see the angst in his face at this making sure he doesn't make a mistake, you know, and then the relief. The fist pump at the end as he knows he's got the title. I, I love it. All right, so we've got a forum post in general banter uh, from Seth Lee, and he basically went to hunt the hobbies lists that are out there and discovered that sim racing is not listed on almost pretty much any 
website out there as a as a hobby. He gives examples. He links several different uh, lists on the internet of hobbies and yeah, where is sim racing? And and the answer he got from many people was look it you're grouped in with under computer games basically so find those lists find computer games and sim racing is part of that that's legit also is it really just a hobby <laughs> i guess i mean i my, i was just talking to my cousin who flies drones and i think he has more money in his drones than i have in my rig so well, it's, it's a lifestyle a yeah, it's not a common hobby, so that's maybe why they didn't make it didn't make the list. Yeah, I just I don't. I, I, yes, I guess it's a video game, but I don't know. It, uh, there's not a. I think there's a whole lot of professional basketball players playing NBA 2K or 4K or anything, are they? No, they don't grab. They don't jump on a video game to improve their. Uh, their on court performance. Uh, you know, that's my whole issue with just looping us in with video games. Yeah, hobby is a is a kind of a you know, it's a word that could be used for it because I always compare it to golf. Like, well, I could be spending all this money golfing, you know, like other people my age. Um, but I spend all my money racing instead. Well, I, when people, you know, ask me what my hobby is or we're talking about it, I always say sim racing. And that's what I always say. And then, of course, I have to explain what it is, which takes about a half an hour. But, yeah, to me, it's a hobby. Right. It's a lifestyle for me. It's it's a little – because we do the podcast, too, and we have the team, and we have – and we're all friends. I mean, and, and that's that's fun. So, uh, you know, we interact on a regular basis daily. So – uh that's why i call it a lifestyle i guess uh, we've all got mike convinced that we're his friends <laughs> no what i like about it is you know first i was a nascar fan a race fan and i watched it and all that and then i was a covid baby with sim racing here and it made me feel more connected to the nascar guys you know i get out on track i feel the same stuff they do you know when the announcer says they hit a bump and get loose well i felt that bump you know, it just brings you closer to your interest. If you go to a real race after you've been irising, you don't even look at the track the same way. All right. Well, iRacing has done something and kind of beaten real NASCAR to the punch. They've gone across the pond. We we're hearing constantly that NASCAR wants to get, uh, an international race. Well, the Coke series did it this week, didn't they, uh, Mike? Yeah. Brands hatch. And, uh, guess who Bobby Zelensky wins. Yeah. I, I you know, I kind of thought he would win it. I mean, he's always the guy to pick, uh, at these road courses, um, in the Coke series over the years. And, uh, sure enough, he gets it done. You know, I kind of watched just parts of this because it was boring. I told Brad, man, it's kind of boring. You know, I, there wasn't a lot of passing and this and that. But at the end, we actually ended up with a nice little battle between Vicente Salas and uh, Bobby Zelensky. And Vicente was actually hunting him down. I mean, he was on him like glue. And he made a mistake and went off. And, and that gave Bobby the win. I told you they should have run the, uh, I think it's what, the Indy circuit, which is the short circuit there. Probably would have been much better. It was all about who couldn't make a mistake. I mean, I mean that's, and who could take the corners, you know, right out to the edge without getting in the grass and try to get that straight off run. And that's, yeah, I was kind of snooze fest. I don't know why. And this, this track has some, some, carpet Kirby areas that look just like the grass. Were they like typical NASCAR, Mike, all over the, the track limits? Did you notice? Not really, but there's grass and dirt off of that uh, fake 
green part that David's referring to. And yeah, if they went off there, they're done, you know. So does it just uh, I haven't watched a Coke series in a while, and it really doesn't matter on a on an oval. But do they have incident limits? They do, and they can be set, set down on the next race, uh, okay, or get skipped. Okay. Well, that particular kind of incident is counted a different way, in that they actually do adjudicate incidents. They determine fault. What? No. Well, they got a guy. Yeah, they have a you know staff to review it. Well, I mean, you can get that in leagues too. It's just uh, every our experiences with the leagues is that the the, the the determinations of fault seem to always have shades of pink. I wouldn't say gray. More like I don't know. I was just picking any other color than gray. Okay, and then Brad, can you read anything into the segment business? Well, we talked, you remember they were breaking them up in five rounds. So um, we concluded last last week was the end of the first segment. Um, so and then the standings start again as this is race one of segment two. Um, so with Bobby Zelensky in, in the in the win, uh, with the with the win there, but then I think I saw somewhere where they had posted they had an era in the I guess the points when they did this, so I didn't put it up there to be honest with you by mistake. Um, but yeah, I don't I think we talked before that the, the points are obviously not carrying over segment to segment. Well, okay, so they are right. and they this aren't, is, they're keeping two scores. This was the start of the second segment. So the running order is the running of, of the race. What well, is the running order for segment two? Because it's the first race of segment two. That's the way I read it. But then well, we also have an overall total yes. after, five, after five rounds. Sounds confusing. It is. I, that's, how, that's why I, I asked Brad to try to explain it. And obviously, <laughs> it's very confusing. Well, Casey's still the overall point leader. Stephen Wilson's sitting second with one win. You also got now Zelensky and Tinsley in the top overall 10 with one win then in segment two they're in, in their running order is the linsky silas uh Min mentor white and wilson confusing yes just like you know when you try to explain the play at nascar playoffs to anybody who doesn't follow nascar and they're like huh well what's not confusing is what's going on this week in i racing justin yeah, iRacing's got a post here of uh, various things, uh, various races going on. The like the Road America 500, uh, that uh, 124 laps at Road America with the Nissan GTP and the Audi 90, NIS at Texas, 100 and I think 34 laps. Yep. Then the F4s, which I'm not familiar with, the rest of these. Yeah, so they've been putting up this post or story each each week, just kind of highlighting some of the stuff that's going on, some of the special races, some of the uh, you know the weekly series, Draftmaster, Ringmaster, and stuff like that. Some of your official iRacing esports. Um, you know, we'll get into a little bit later. Rainmaster is a new series that they're starting this week, so um, you know the BMW and stuff like that. So just a kind of a good way to to find out what's going on as a whole. Uh, over across the whole series from a special side of things. Right. Make sure we're not missing something. And so that's the next one, Brad, is they announced the Rain Master series. And yep. it will always have light rain and feature the Ferrari 296 GT3. Yep. So week one schedule, like Mike said, it's the Ferrari uh, at Autodroma Internacional uh, del Mugello. Uh, the Grand Prix circuit. So, yeah, I mean, we we talked. We figured there was going to be something coming that would always have rain. Um, I guess there's a bunch of, you know, guys that just like to torture themselves and drive in the rain. Not me. Did it all day today. It wasn't fun. Um, so, but, hey, you need to get some practice. There's a good way to do it. 
you know, the only surprise is why this wasn't rolled out initially when they rolled out rain. I mean, why why did we wait three weeks or whatever it is before they rolled this out? Probably just to make sure it was all ready. Well, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, sometimes I'll jump on the computer and I'm like, I'd like to race in rain. And I go looking for a rain race and I can't find one. <laughs> and so I've been waiting for this, you know, and I will participate in this. I guarantee it. I don't think I've even used the sports car license since it's come out. And so, um, now that it's separate from my F4 license, I could give a crap. I'm going to go run in the rain. If I, you know, kill my license. Oh, well. All right. Well, we already mentioned it a little bit earlier in the, this week, the road America 500 is coming up. It's the vintage sports cars, the Audi 90 and the Nissan GTP. It's running April 12th through the 14th. And I think pretty much almost all the standard start times, standard classes, incident limits, et cetera, et cetera. Let's take a peek though. Yeah, it's got the five, it's got five time slots that, instead of just four, I guess, because since it's a short enough race, they're putting in that extra uh, Sunday time slot. Got to have that D 4.0 license, 30 minutes of warming up. And something that we did learn at Sebring is that the on-time clock, at least at Sebring, was exactly 30, basically about 30 minutes after the, the on-time clock was when the session starts. So if it says the session starts at 1 for the track time so the sun's at one o'clock at you know up high in the sky um then it'll be 140 when you go into the race yeah and you can do this solo so it's not a uh ten, it, it while well, it's a team event you can run, run it solo i don't think anybody on our team's running this i haven't heard i don't think i own either car i don't i do not All right, podcast housekeeping, leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform to make it easier for more listeners to find us. Mention the podcast to your fellow drivers so they don't miss out. We do appreciate it. Check out our Discord and get involved in the discussion. You can see some of the videos David puts up asking uh, who wrecked who. It's kind of fun. Uh, we have a website, iRacersLounge.com, and we have a merchandise website, iRacersLounge.shop. And we're in regular rotation at Performance Motorsports Network. All right, let's talk fantasy. Brad, how did how did who do? All right, so our results from uh, Martinsville. Uh, the winner for 266 points had XJs on the fireball, followed by Shane, 72-72. Ashley Cantu was third, uh, tied with Canadrian. Uh, fifth was Mackenzie Stevens. Tied uh, with Pete Racing, Fat Boy, 1990 was seventh, uh, Vol, 1977, eighth, uh, and also tied for eighth was North South Racing, and then tenth was Matt Rob, 40. So you were there. How many hot dogs did you get? Uh, I ate, what I eat? Only ate two and a half. So wife and I got a uh, four pack and uh, she ate about, a, I guess about one and a third. She ate and I ate the rest. So two and two and a third, two thirds, something like that. Uh, could have eaten a lot more, but uh, I didn't want to do it. Uh, good race. I mean, it's Martinsville. Was it exciting? No. Um, it's what I expected going in, knowing that we have the worst short track car we've ever had probably in the series. Um, but, you know, a bad day at the race is better than a good day at home. Did you Good. get the, um, the works on the hot dog? Absolutely. You got to have the chili and the mustard and the onion and the coleslaw. It's the only way to get it. So I think we walked a mile to get one, but uh, it was, it was, it was good. Um, you know, look, just if you listen to any of the NASCAR podcasts, you've been hearing the same thing all week. Um, it's just a frustrating race. I mean, 
you sit there and you watch a guy who's a lap down or trying not to get lapped can can run ahead of the leader for 50 60 laps um you know the last run you had Kyle Busch just ran behind William Byron for the entire last uh stint and you know could never pull away it's just you know, all, all we've ever asked for is parity, and this is what you get when 36 cars can run the same speed. And I can say 37 because the 66 car was out there, and he was probably three seconds off the pace. Um, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's broke. Need to fix it. I think, um, like I told you guys in the chat, I think Denny on his podcast, like I told you, I'm not a Denny fan. I'm not a Denny fan as a driver. I'm a Denny podcast fan. And he explained the whole process. So when this car just came out of, you know, everybody was winning different winners and he explained why, and then he explains why they're, we're so tight in parody now. And it, it's a neat little listen. I think the tires are too wide. I think that's the, a, a fatal flaw if they could just go back to the Gen 6 tire width that we had. I think they got to junk the car to change the tires on yeah. the whole concept. Yeah, the contact patch is too big. Um, the shifting is another problem. You know, why was the racing better on Friday night and Saturday night? Because if you go in and blow the corner, you can't downshift and just drive back off the corner. Um you know, look, I, I can remember going, I, this is the first Martinsville race we've been to in probably, uh, I would say over 20 years. It's probably the late nineties when we went and we used to sit low coming out of turn two, because it was wonderful to watch the guys come off the corner and tank slap it all the way down the back stretch and leave in black marks. Um, you didn't see that the guys just come off the corner, push the power down drive. Um, you know, just, it's not racing. It's not short track racing. And uh, we're going to get ready to go to uh, North Wilkesboro for the all-star race. And if they don't do something, it's going to be just as bad as it was last year. So. So I want to tie it back to iRacing real quick. You know, we saw how you just described where the lap car, like the leader can't get to the bumper of the lap car to literally get to him. But we don't have that problem in iRacing. So what's the difference? We are not pros. Yeah, that it, that's that's what it comes down to. A great podcast to listen to is the Money Lap with Parker Kligerman and um, uh, gosh, right out of my mind. Uh, they talked a lot about this. Look, the guys that are that are in the cars on Sundays, they're the best. I mean, I think what the top thirty-two cars were separated by two tenths of a second qualifying. I mean, come on. When everybody's running the same speed, it's just about track position. Yes, William Byron was able to pass, but at the end of the day, when Joey Logano gets out there and runs 180 laps on his on his left side tires, and they blistered from the heat, not from wear, that that's all it was. You know, it, it's again the tires the problem. That's one of the problems. Um, but uh, it's Landon Castle is on the podcast with. Uh, Parker Kligerman, but Landon talks extensively about all of the changes that have been made over the years for aero and, and how all the mechanical grip is gone. Um, it's an interesting listen, but uh, it's it just, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm not a fan of the car. Um, I, I don't know what they're going to do because there's hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in this car and it's just not, it's not doing what it was supposed to do the first year. Yes, it was okay because guys are trying to figure it out, but look, at the end of the day, these are smart guys. They're going to figure it out. And, you know, when all the parts come from a common manufacturer, there's no creativity left. Um, it's just, it's, it's IROC. And, and I don't want IROC on Sundays. Um, if I want to watch IROC, I watch IROC. That's fine. You know, it's, it's why we don't like fixed up, set up races. I don't want to drive the same thing everybody else is driving. Texas. What do we like at Texas? I mean, Gosh, you gotta, you can't go against William Byron. His win percentage this year is like 38% or something. I mean, you gotta pick William. It'll probably be a Chevrolet or a Toyota. I mean, it's one of the two. Um, and I, I mean, Larson Reddick. was, Larson was good there till he wrecked last year. Um, Reddick has a win with, uh, with Childers. Um, yeah, I mean, again, it's, I'm glad to get back to a mile and a half. Um, 
because at least we think the racing will be better. Will there be fall off? No. Did we we have fall off in i racing? It seemed like a little bit. Yes, we do, but uh, it'll be a hard tire, and it'll be what it'll be. Um, I don't know. I think Texas on i racing is fun. I mean, it falls off perfect. You got to drive it. You got to pedal it. Yeah, I think I found something today that you uh, you gave me a tip on, Justin, that I'm I'm running better there. So I'm I'm actually looking forward to tomorrow night. Yeah, there's, I mean, look, last night before I had my issues, you know, I was making hay on the outside. Guys were just hooking the bottom, and uh, I was making a ton of speed on the outside. And uh, you just got to be willing to put the car out there and drive it. Um, but, yeah, it was fun. All right, so to wrap up the uh, fantasy uh, overall league standings, we got Cletus, uh, four. 545 with 1627, followed by Iris and Mason, Canadrian, Dollar Sense, Connor Truman, North South Racing, Mike Wuju, Pete Racing, Fat Boy 1990, and Rez Dog in 10th. Don't forget to set your lineups before Sunday. All right, let's open up hardware with too much power, or is it? What do you think, Mike? No, I didn't expect this, but uh, VNM Simulation, which I believe is the uh, simulation company from Vietnam, they have a wheelbase, uh, a 32 Newton meter wheelbase, and it's uh, it's a beauty. I mean, it's got that semi cube and uh, look. It looks like a semi cube kind of uh, industrial look. Fairly small, looks really heavy massive uh header on it you know to, for the qr but uh, we have a video here uh taking a look at it now i i we we didn't get him to try it yet but that'll be a, a, a future video yeah alan kwan talks about this and 32 newt meters is a lot um yeah he didn't I, I don't know if anybody would need to run it that heavy um but he brings up a point, and I agree, you know, the, the neck or whatever you want to call it, I think it's big and fat. And if you like to situate your monitors down, you know, right behind your wheel, you're going to struggle with that with that thing. But I guess 32 newton meter, it's got to be pretty good size. Well, yeah, maybe that's why it's big, because of the power. But... Look at the housing. It, even the, the strip, there's like a little uh, strip about two-thirds of the way to, uh, down the, the housing. I think SemiCube even has that same strip. I mean, I think they kind of stole some ideas from SemiCube. Well, that's what I'm th that's what I'm trying to say in a nice way. Uh, well, look, it, it's it in doesn't. The carbon copy. No, it, I mean, the it doesn't look much different than my Sim Magic. Um, you know, they're that's very... Point. Yeah, I mean they're all very similar. It's a servo motor. Um, you know the the what did we look at the? Uh, There's one we looked at it maybe last week. Uh, is it the Moza? It was one of the maybe it was the Moza was that bigger one, but once you take the case off of it, it looks just like this inside. Well, even the power brick is the same as semi cube. It looks identical. It does, and so I like that there's uh, there's multiple choices out here. I mean, they, they, they keep, keep coming. It's great. What what are you running, Mike? You got the, what, SimiQ Pro? I have the Pro, which is 25. Do you run yours at full, at 100%? Yes. Yeah, I got the same as Mike. I just, I don't know, 32. And, and Justin, you're... Just recently, you've changed to you're running 100 percent as well, right? Yeah, you completely turned my racing. Not upside. I was having a bad spell, and that completely changed everything. It changed the car. Period. I bet you there's a lot of people out there not doing that that auto feature on the force feedback. Yeah, it's the only way to do it. Um, so I do it mine. So you just set it up each car when you go. I mean, anytime you go out, flip it, let it calibrate, and hit the button, and go. It kind of made me mad. I've been running it for a year and haven't been utilizing it to its fully capable. 
pull this capability, $1,200 thing, and I wasn't using it right. Oh, wait a minute. So, so basically, you just set it at a certain at a certain level at, at one day, and then you never touched it again. Basically, correct. I just ran it straight through software. I never thunk it through iRacing. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, for the calibration. Yeah, I mean, what iRacing does is it looks at the forces of the car and it'll go ahead and adjust for what it is. So, it doesn't I mean it? It changes track to track. So. You got to make sure you do it each time. If you go from Martinsville to Texas, um, you know, same car, go ahead and let it auto calibrate and then hit the button. It'll, it'll adjust the strength. So it's much better I, feel. I was feeling slides like mush, apparently. Then this just, as soon as I feel a tire crack loose, I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> there it is. It'll change be between sets in the same car. Like I'll be running open all week in the a nis and then i'll run fixed and it's different <laughs> because it's a different set so wh where do you set that at you hit the f9 button what now look you have to be run a couple laps first so it can get some data the auto button will be grayed out for until you run about 45 seconds maybe 60 seconds or so now once you do that then you click over to f9 you push that auto button and it will automatically adjust the newton meter strength in the you know in in that moment yeah just make sure in the option setting under the steering that you don't have the auto set there if you do that'll mess it up so make sure that's unchecked go out and run a few laps and it'll adjust uh, automatically and i think the way it, I, you know, the reason I think I told you, Justin, you, you, you were saying you're running the tires off. And I said, look, you got to let the steering wheel base help you not oversteer the car. So I told you about the auto button and you tried it. And then, and so because the strength is stronger, it's forcing you not to turn the wheel as much, right? Correct. I, yeah, I had the problem. I was running at Richmond, and every time I ran on the outside of somebody and tried to keep a position or door to door with them, then I would just spin out and smoke the wall, and then my race was over. And that solved it. So that's the beauty of a stronger wheelbase uh, for for that kind of thing, especially with a, for an oval racer. Now, is twenty five enough? I feel like it is. I have. I don't think I've ever had a, a instance where I don't feel like I have enough. No, and I think you see most if you watch any of the reviews, any of the guys that have been doing this, whether it's Will Ford, um, a bunch of them will say, yeah, that kind of that sweet spot for most people is going to be that ten to fifteen newt meters. Um, I've got a fifteen newt meter sim magic. Um, I, I don't know. If, I really don't think I need any more than that. I get enough out of that. Um, you know, the one thing I think that you do find with with more power, you typically can get more fidelity. Um, it's one of the things that they say, but uh, you know, it, uh, I'm happy with mine right now. No issues. All right, let's wrap that. Coming soon, a video is posted on Instagram showing the Home Revolution Three Five. What do you think of this, John? It's uh, this is something that doesn't seem to be what something we've seen before. Uh, we have not. Looks like Vla Vladimir Putin is getting into the sim racing business. He, we've got this company, a Game Stool, I believe is what it's called. But these are made in Russia. Uh, they're they're sim rigs. They've got different designs. They've got tubular designs. Uh, you know, different ones. Um, you know, they they look kind of lightweight. The designs are a little different. They've got one that has the the mount for the steering wheel right between your legs, which I don't want. Uh, yeah, some different designs and colors we haven't seen before. Well, this one that's in the Instagram called the Home Revolution, I really like the this design. It's really for a a person with limited space where it kind of folds up. We talked about the coffee table one, you know, where it all folds into a coffee table. Well, this folds up into a really nice package as well um, and can be easily unfolded. Now, the difference is it actually looks like it's raceable, like you're going to have some good adjustability in the wheel and in the pedals 
uh, everything, you know, looks like it's pretty sturdy. Uh, but yeah, if you're, if you're having a, a problem with, you know, space, this is kind of a neat idea. You do not want to put a big drive on that thing though. No, I wouldn't well, put a big wheelbase on that. No. It just looks thin. So have we ever encountered anybody on track from Russia? I don't know if I have. Do they have a club? I don't know if they do. I would assume they would. Not, or they fall in Asia, maybe. Uh, Russia can't. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I know they're kind of just doing, as far as real life sports, they're just doing their own leagues now, right? Because most of their drivers aren't allowed to race internationally. All right, um, Mike, I got to give this one to you because you were overexcited about it earlier. Yeah, Greg seemed to forget what an active pedal was this week, and I had to explain it to him in the chat. But SemiCube makes active pedals. I described it as a pedal hooked to a track drive, but it's really hooked to like a piston motor kind of thing. And and then somebody on our team said, well, this can't be better in hydraulic, but actually it's just as good as hydraulic because with the software and the, the motor, you can replicate the feel of a hydraulic pedal. Um, anyway, this post is from Daniel Morad. He shares his uh, active pedal profile that matches his actual real world Mercedes GT3. And I love stuff like this. And in, in fact, I use Daniel Morad's um, driving uh, profiles for the semi cube base um, all the time because um, he, he just knows how to dial this stuff in. And if I was to buy an active brake, I would probably download his profile for this as well. Yeah, that's the one advantage with, with SemiCube is the, the the ability to to share the, the profiles like that. Um, it's the one thing that makes me the only, the only regret I got is, is just that. I question race, racing in socks, though, if it really has the same feel. He's got to have that softened up because when when you've got a – a brake pedal that you actually really have to put real life pressure on. Um, that's rough on the feet. Well, I'll, I'll full disclosure. He sells all this stuff. So that's one reason I think he races in socks. He makes gloves and socks and all that to sell as well. So that wouldn't surprise me. But I, I would also not be surprised that he runs the same brake pressure that his actual car is run running. So even if he is in a sock, but I is like the idea sock of in the real car. <laughs> no, I'm sure he has some, some kind of shoes for fire protection, but look, I, I love the idea of buying one of these and then downloading a profile for each car that's created by a real life driver, you know, that you're confident. Oh, this feels like a Mercedes. And then you get a, this profile. Well, this one feels like a Ferrari, you know, and, that would be just so cool because there's no way I could dream up or the settings, you know, to make them just right. We talked about podium racing it has been got a couple pallets of these and they're selling them actively right now. 2,400 for one. Free shipping. Divorce, divorce, divorce. I'm, I'm just tempted, but I need some other stuff first before I get it. Well, if it's free shipping, I'm in. I saved two hundred dollars and only had to spend ten thousand to do it. Hey, that's girl yeah. math. So Podium is partnering up the pedal with Heiskenfelds for uh, for the throttle and clutch. I hope Heiskenfeld makes a hydraulic add-on someday. I wouldn't hold your breath for that. Nah. I wouldn't. We have access to a good hydraulic pedal. Um, but if you like doing it yourself, Brad, what do you think of this steering wheel? 
Yeah, so uh, Dan Suzuki reviews the DIY uh, Pokornoia engineering wheel. I don't know, I'm not saying it right, but uh, so I watched this, I guess, about a week or so ago. Um, kind of goes through the steps of where you can buy all this stuff in order to, to build the wheel. Um, you know, all together, he's got about 800, I guess, is that euro uh, in it. Uh, it's pretty neat. Um, you know, he's got another video, I guess, where he really walks you completely through it. Um, again, I'm not that DIY. I would not even attempt to do it. You know, he talks about, oh, it's a little bit of soldering and stuff like that. Nope, 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 nope. Not going to happen. Right. Nope. Just have it ship it to me. Let me plug it in and I'm good to go. But uh, hey, when he look. said the word soldering, I was <laughs> Yeah. But look, I mean, that's the one thing with our community. I mean, there's lots of guys that are DIY. Um, you know, with this. Um, so there's somebody out there can tackle this. Uh, you know, is it Justin? Are you the one with the, uh, with the, the homemade button box? Yeah. I'm kind of curious now. I haven't watched this video because well, I, that's, there you that's, go. that's one thing I'm lacking is a uh, formula. You guys got me doing this road racing, unfortunately, but I like it. And, um, yeah, so I might dig into this. I think you need to. It might be fun. All right. We were just talking about it, but Tony Kanan was also just talking about it. He has reviewed the SemiCube Active Pedal, Mike. Yeah. And Tony uh, takes it the next level from Daniel. Daniel just shared a, his profile. Well, Tony shows us in the software how to create that profile. And he, uh, he walks you through the different steps, uh, what to adjust, and and he, you know, he he has his mouse on it, and he's talking about what it does, and like the throw distance of the pedal, and and different things, and what does the curve mean, and how do you adjust it, and and those kind of things. So it, again, man, I'm I'm just jealous. To, I really want a pair of these. Or I don't even know if you need a pair of these. I think one of them is enough and and then you just get some regular pedals for the other for the others well i, I think you can i always look to professional drivers and look at what kind of hardware they use these are the guys that are looking for something that's going to simulate uh as close to what they deal with um when they're in the car so i, I think you can take a little bit of credence from some of these guys once you get outside the paid stuff um, and whatnot, but um, you know that's one thing I do like about Tony and about uh, Daniel Morad, and even I mean even with some of the you know the hardware manufacturers that do provide stuff for other drivers, um, you know I, I just think you can find some credence if you do a little bit of digging and, and you know I, I guess like Mike says like, I get a little more I want to I like the idea of being able to feel the same thing that a professional driver does when he's in the actual car. Pretty neat uh, video. If you're interested in these pedals, you definitely need to watch Tony's video. All right, Justin, we have a hub to feature. Yeah. Uh, Conbit has a new hub called the H. Hey, oh, and I'm kind of naive when it comes to these things. So is this just an add-on for a rim? You add a rim to it, yeah, basically, to make a wheel. Typical yeah. con spit, kind of hard to decipher what they're showing us. But yeah, I mean, it's a wheel, a, bu a button box, basically, to, to mount a wheel to. Actually, if this one, if you dive into the to the Instagram post. This is a, this is a pretty good ad. It's a, it's more like a brochure almost. They got a lot of different pictures, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Probably go to the website and you can't find any information on it, which is what's been the constant thing with Conspit. I mean, it looks pretty nice, but you know, it's, it's hard to tell because a lot of these pictures you're just seeing close-ups and that kind of stuff. So I don't know. Well, I mean, it comes down, you put a, you attach a wheel to this, you know, how easy is it going to be for you to reach? Um, 
the buttons and, and all that. I mean, I can remember this, you know, the first one to do this was Fanatec with the, um, whatever they called it back in the day. I still have it. I just can't think of what it's called, Universal Hub or whatever. Um, you know, I got that and put it on a 13-inch uh, round wheel, and it was it was okay. There were some stretches to, to get to it. Um, but, you know, I think it's a neat idea, but they're not the first ones to do it. Um, multiple uh, wheel makers and stuff, you know, have these available. Something that uh, caught my eye in here that I've never seen before is it's got asymmetric dual clutch pedals so it's got one i guess that is shorter for a snappier quicker release and another one that is longer for more precise control when you're engaging the clutch and you can pick which side you want each on yeah ace attack has the same kind of you know thing where you pick your rim you pick your button box you can get multiple rims on the same button box you know All right, John, there's a new spotter pack. Yes, that is right. So a lot of you know about the Jimmy Johnson spotter pack. I've used it off and on. Uh, they've got a new version out, version 7.50, and it it's an update to cover a couple of the, the – some of the things that iRacing has done in their last couple of builds, so they've added those. And I, I, di I assume this is both the regular version and the cusp pack uh, that, that they have. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's an update. And if you use that, that Jimmy Johnson spotter pack, you can go to dwwarehouse.com uh, or to the Google drive. They've in our show notes, we've got a link to it, uh, to download the new version. I don't think I've used this since the NR 2003 days. Is it time for the maker of the Jimmy Johnson cuss pack to maybe update to a, a current driver? <laughs> You know, an interesting uh, pack might actually be Brett from from Door Bumper Clear. That would be funny. Yeah, but I don't know if there's enough stuff out there. He's not. Isn't how about Freddie and Bubba? Well, I think the Moon Car guy. Look, I, I've been at the racetrack this past week, and uh, you know we've had a scanner for years, so. Um, you know, listening to TJ and, and Brad was was just gold. Um, you know, it's just <laughs> it was it was good. Yeah, that would be a good one, TJ and Brad. Well, you got the TJs built into in, into our racing, but uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I get again, I get nervous. You know, with with some of these, and I think we've had that discussion too. That with the the add on stuff, if as I race continues to implement stuff, are we potentially losing something that gets added in in the midst with rain or or whatever it is, the damage and, and whatnot? Um, you know, there's the fear with some of these third parties things that you're going to miss some sort of information. All right, Brad, rock us through this next wheel review. Yep, so Sean Cole at the Sim Pit reviews the new Evo 32R leather wheel from Thrustmaster. Um, Sean, as usual, does a very good, you know, thorough review. Uh, this is for the Thrustmaster uh, ecosystem. Um, I think it's compatible with whichever is the new quick release they have versus the old. Um, you know, he gave it a, a, a good review. Um, you know, it's... It's a mid-level wheel. Again, you're you're in that Thrustmaster ecosystem. Um, one thing that always discouraged me, and he even mentions it, is when you, you know, the the, the quick release is plastic with the Thrustmaster. Uh, that would make me very nervous. Um, you know, but I think if you're if you're in that ecosystem, it, it was a good wheel. Um, you know, thirty two, it's three hundred, I guess three hundred twenty millimeters. Um, so it's a nice overall, uh, good size wheel kind of fit almost any anything that you're doing uh in in the sim from rally to oval or or anything um you know the one thing i did think was kind of neat with the the leds on top of this the way that they're configurable is you can have um you know your rpms but also on either end there's a larger led that can work like a spotter or can do uh flags whether it's a blue flag or a yellow flag so that was that was kind of neat um 
again, it's it's an ecosystem. If you're in it, um, give it a watch. Um, I, I think, yeah, again, if you're in that system, it's it's probably a decent wheel. I like the thickness of the the leather um, round part, really thick. Um, like you, the Fanatec wheels are a lot thinner. This one's really got some heft to it. But look, yeah, if you bought this base, I mean, this is the best wheel you're going to get. <laughs> But, you know, I don't know if I'd recommend Thrustmaster. I mean, it, 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 like you said, the compatibility um, problems, the, the plastic, you know, quick release, there's just so many better options. Yeah, and it's expensive. I mean, I think, you know, some of their stuff, the Ferrari wheel, you know, you're paying for the license for Ferrari and stuff like that. Um, yes, I think there's better options out there. This uh, next title is brilliant with the with the branding, and I know you just did, but you got to take this one too since it's your brand. Are you a sim magician? <laughs> yeah, so we had a uh, Instagram post from Sim Magic, uh, former F one driver Rubens Barrichello uh, is now part of the Sim Magic family. So uh, it was an Instagram post uh, with him rocking the. I'm probably assuming it's going to be the uh, the Alpha uh, Alpha U base, which is their 23 newton meters, I think. Uh, set of P two thousands. Probably got a handbrake or something else thrown in here, and then uh, they're also their their GT wheel as well. So uh, Rubens got a picture of him here. God, he looks old. Makes me feel even older. I remember him running an F one. So uh, again, pretty neat to see uh, these guys. And look, I mean, once you're a racer, that itch is always there. So you got to find an outlet for it. That's what I love about Tony Canon. And even though he's re retired from the real world he's still sim racing so love it i love the rig uh looks like it's made by extreme something extreme uh white with orange accents um 80 20 kind of style um uh, very neat looking rig yep with his branding on there with his with the with the rubens logo and stuff yeah it's, it's pretty pretty cool rig need to uh someone needs to get him to to go ahead and switch to some triples and get rid of that ultra wide. Sim magic. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, like I said, there's some really good options out there. If you buy into an ecosystem like sim magic, I think you, you're, you're okay. I mean, they have some good stuff. Well, and the one thing I like, you know, you don't have to stay in their ecosystem either. So with the quick release, like, you know, my MPI wheel, you know, they're, they have an NRG style quick release. So you can really put that on any sort of either 50 millimeter or 70 millimeter wheel. Um, that's the beauty of it too. You're not locked into one certain thing. Um, you know, you need to like the same you can do. You can put the quick release like you've got on your MPI wheel. So that's the one thing I like about just going with a direct drive maker is yes, they have an ecosystem, but you can get outside of that ecosystem as opposed to a Logitech, a Thrustmaster, fan attack stuff like that all right let's talk wheels john we got a bundle it looks like yeah looks like gomez and semicube have teamed up uh with a with a new uh gt wheel and you know i mean these these companies they put out good products uh, so if you're looking for a GT wheel, this is this is worth looking into. I don't, you, I would go so far as to say when it comes to Gomez and Semicube, you you can't go wrong. You just got to open up the checkbook. The question will be, what kind of deal is it? Um, or are they just adding the two products together and making a bundle? But it's basically Gomez's uh, previously announced uh, V2 version two of their wheel but with the semi-cube colors and the semi-cube uh, quick release, you know, pre-installed. And obviously you pair it with a semi-cube 2 Pro base uh, to go with it. Uh, it goes on sale next week uh, is what it says. So we'll, f we'll see what the price is, if it's a deal. Um, but I don't know if I, you know, it, I would only do the bundle if I really wanted that Gomez version 2 wheel. Um, I don't know if that's the one I would pick right now. 
Yeah, that's always the the gamble with a bundle. I mean, a bundle means here are your choices, this one and that one, and that's it. And so, you know, you got to know that this is what you want together uh, or, or you don't want a bundle. Yeah, I'm sure it's a good wheel. Um, but right now, I yeah, really like the VPG. All right, Justin, have you got a neck workout? Oh, well, if I use this thing, I would. Uh, Breck them took to Instagram to show off their F1 mocked up cockpit with a six DOF and a body of body and two DOF of head motion. And this looks like a very interesting contraption. It actually gives you head movement, G force. Um, it gives you the G force in your head when you're going around a turn and like an Indy car it's showing. Well, look, we've seen this before where he had the halo on the head and then it would pull left or right with like some rubber band type stuff. But now this new addition is he's got the elastic uh, rubber band things uh, hooked to the halo on front and back. So he's literally got four DOF on the head now, four directions of movement. Um, so you put your head in the halo thing and and as you go around the track, it you know, the halo's moving about. It looks realistic. I mean it's 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 minute movements. It's not like it's moving your head all over the place. Um it, it looks pretty cool. Uh I don't know. I mean it's six degrees in the body of the so the, the tub, then you've got two degrees in the head. So it's I don't know. <laughs> That's a lot of movement. You look like a science project in that thing. I'm trying to imagine getting in it. No, look at how that thing pulls your it pulls the halo to the left, you know, as he goes around the corner. You know imagine you're sitting in your cockpit, you turn the wheel and your head is like literally pulled to the left. Like, yeah. And then what if David could hook it up with his flight sim? Be jerking his head all around. It would suck if you got in a flat spin. Next up, we have a play seat formula intelligence racing cockpit. And it's featuring the F1 logo. It's nice looking. It's also, but it's not nice pricing. <laughs> yeah. Did you see the price? 4K. That's wow. just for the rig. That's no wheel, no nothing. Just $4,000 for that F1 branding. Oh, my goodness. And it's it's a tube frame with a seat. And, a, and it's obviously in the, in the formula position. I'd rather have 80-20 built one. Yeah, this is not something I would buy, but boy, it kind of looks nice, but not for four grand. If it was 400, I think they might be able to sell it. Oh, there's a sucker born every night. The only plus that it, it has for, as far as the play seat ecosystem is it doesn't have the the center post. So your legs are not blocked in the pedals. Look how thin the the wheel base mounting plate is it it's super thin it doesn't look like it would hold it steady it's a big no for me all right john what is the best cpu for sim racing well i wish i knew because i'm ready getting ready to upgrade but dan suzuki did a review on the uh, what he thinks the best CPU for sim racing is. I didn't get to watch the whole video because I was trying to do it at work and got sidetracked with work. But um, I, so I didn't get his conclusion here. What did he say? It's a seventy eight hundred X three D is the clear winner over Intel. All right, I want to preference this first. So if you're an iRacer. You need to be cautious with this because what he tested this on was 
a set of Corsa. Um, and I, some of these newer, the other games are not as CPU driven as iRacing is. And, and iRacing is very CPU driven, unfortunately. That's one of the downsides of unfortunately working with the engine that they have that's been around since 2003. Um, Add to that, no. they, they are um, running a lot of, you're running a lot of third party apps usually. Now they have ported a lot of the, of the service onto different CPUs. They run the sound runs on a separate CPU. Uh, oh, so there's a lot of things. It's no longer just running on one core, but it does not take the advantage that some other games do currently though. So if you look ahead in the video, he actually measures iRacing racing as well as a set of Corsa. And so, um, his iRacing racing was 1440 P triples, three laps at Daytona night with the rain. And uh, the 7800X3D uh, FPS average was 107, um, while the 7950X3D was a little less at 104, just a little less. And then the Intel chips were quite a bit less, 99 and 94. I mean, I bet you he's right, because I got the little brother to the CPU, the 5850X3D. And I could probably use just a little bit more CPU, and I run the 6950 AMD card, and I could use just a little bit more CPU. I've just always been an Intel guy. Everything I've ever built has been Intel. But if I'd have to build another one again, I will go Intel because I think, I'm no computer guy, but I think iRacing works better with Intel and NVIDIA than AMD. I always kind of mess with crap. Yeah, graphic GPU wise, yes, NVIDIA has always been better with iRacing versus AMD. I've always been Intel and uh, NVIDIA as well. So I'm a little hesitant to switch brands. But, you know, these numbers are very telling. I mean, it, it clearly appears that that chip's a better chip. I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll have to see. I, you know, I'm kind of my computer goes south any more than it has been, I'm definitely going to be building. Okay, next up on the Will of Wheels is a Will. But we don't have a Will to talk about it, so let's have Mike talk about it. Sure. The, yeah, this is the Cube Controls wheel, the GTX2. Um, this one is... What's unique about it is it's got this custom color uh, plate along kind of the bottom. Um, the one that Will is uh, reviewing is white, but I think they have a, a nice green and a, I think a blue maybe. But you can pick what color that is. Gives it a unique look that really differentiates it from other wheels. But other than that, I mean, it's your typical cube controls wheel with a with a monitor on it you know um, they make really good stuff they got that magnet can you know cable um he really liked the this thing has two sets of grips that are interchangeable you got one that's wider than the other um and he, he seemed to like that too he did bring up a, an issue just from the aesthetics there was some overspray um from the painting um now again he said it may just have been his but again you're paying a lot of money i would definitely not expect to have overspray on something yeah i'm gonna look up the price One thousand three hundred eighty-seven euros. So that's fourteen hundred euros. Yeah, that's a lot. Just can't justify that for just the wheel. Well, while we're looking at wheels, tell us more about this next one and how overpriced is it? So this one I, I added late in the day, uh, right before the recording started. So I haven't uh, looked at it too much, but it's from T Engineering Shop from the Netherlands. And, uh, 
you know, I want to say like it's a luxury brand. It's got like a almost like a furry, furry fur kind of VT rim. I, that's the way I recognize it. And then eight very uh, simple buttons. Um, nothing uh, fancy here. It looks very retro, in fact. $520. I, for $520, you can get a lot, uh, a much better GT4 wheel. <laughs> get that Shim Magic Neo that we've been <laughs> talking right. about, right? That's right. <laughs> All right, and I'll take the last one, David. Uh I really am a fan of this lady. Um, she's kind of new to the scene. She has a nice YouTube channel here. Um, we we talked about her doing uh, the the track racer Alpine uh, tubular cockpit, and then she bought the TR one sixty S cockpit blue. Um, and and this video uh, is a build video where she uh, kind of you know, puts everything together and goes through it. And she has a really nice, uh, I think a 65 inch, uh, ultra wide, uh, auto, uh, Samsung monitor. Pretty cool. I really like that, that TR 160 S in blue though. I mean, man, that's a nice rig. You can still see the tubular rig sitting in there as well, and it's got triples, so she just needs to swap those out. Well, she did say that on this one, she went with a single ultra-wide because she already had triples available on the other one. She didn't think she wanted triples again, but she wanted to be able to try the ultra-wide to see you know, how, how it works. Which would just make you want triples. She also teases her next video where she was is going to put uh, the equipment on the rig, and she showed a picture of a pallet uh, she got of stuff. Um, so that I'm looking forward to that video. See which ecosystem did she buy into? Was it Simagic or Ace Attack or or uh, what was it? All right. I guess it's that time. Let's hit some results. Yeah, so let's uh, finish up Martinsville. Friday open, P15. Pretty uneventful race. Ran top five most of the race. On the final restart, I was third coming to the white. I spun down low on my own and screwed up. Finished P15. David, P18. Yeah, this was a sloppy race. I definitely made one of the mistakes myself. Um, I was worried about getting down inside, uh, you know, in one of the rejoins, and I skipped a step and was still in third gear going into the corner and downshifted into second. And and that in the car just did I don't it we did weird stuff. Um, that obviously caused an accident. Um, then a little bit later I got dumped and the guy said he didn't mean to, and he said that he, he thought I diamond the corner. Um, and at first I was like, eh, maybe that's okay. But then I went and took a look at it. And as Greg said in the chat, it's up to the, the, the guy to pass you safely. And he did when, when I took a better look, he just drove in too deep and started to slide up and, and hooked me. But the fact that he apologized, you know, and what one mistake is different and the guy doesn't have a history of of these kind of mistakes so he didn't he didn't like hit me and then turn around and try to say that that i did something wrong which makes it sting a lot less i guess but i, I was already in the bad position because of the mistake i made with the with the incorrect downshift so that's what really in my in my mind ruined my race Chris Waldron, P7. What a crap show. 22X, 25 cautions. That was not fun. Tony Rochette, P27. All right, all right. Moving on to Sunday Open. Uh, David, a P9. Yeah, ran top split. And I was about a 15th place car, but just uh, kept driving and not trying not to make the mistakes I made Friday 
and I didn't, and other people did, and that's how I snuck my way up to ninth. All right, top split. That's a great run. Justin, P22. Not really much to say. I just couldn't stay out of trouble. People just kept hitting me, and I think I made it like 20 to go and finally got the meatball and hung her up. Ouch. All right, Chris Waldron, P18, was six with two to go and was turned. All right, so Sunday fixed. P3, pretty uneventful. Got, I was high as second, but never could get to the lead. There was lots and lots of caution, but man, I'll take that P3. Justin, you got a P2. Yeah, um, I had a chance on this one. I, I, I kind of blew it, but I qualified seventh. I stayed in top five most of the race, had the right strategy, but just couldn't capitalize. I wasn't proud of my driving. Uh, I did a couple bumping runs and a little too much bumping. I never wrecked the people. I just, I moved them up a little bit higher than I wanted to. So, um, but yeah, I, I would have been pissed if it was me. So like I said, I wasn't proud of it. Well, and I, I think you and I were both a little miffed that we're in, we're so close to the win and we, we didn't get it. I mean, you were P2, I'm P3. Uh, we, we just weren't. We didn't have it. We need that track position before the end. And I, I apologize to both the guys that got into it. One of them came back and goes, hey, man, I was on old tires. I was slowing up way too early. And that's kind of how I got him, too. All right. And then Chris, Chris Waldron, a P9, and then Tyler, a P4. I actually watched the last part of Tyler's race. Um, uh, he restarted, I think, fourth uh, on the final restart, and I was trying to guide him to a win but it didn't work out but heck of a run all right moving on to texas i got a p12 i had a real bad first run i ran the tires off of it when i pitted i was at 13 percent. it was around halfway uh, after that i was flying through the field uh david hall my teammate you were on a one stopper i think and you went to pit in front of me you lingered on the track before you turned left onto pit road you were so high up i actually tried to go underneath you um instead of to the right of you and you turned left and i plowed you um anyway um i didn't have too much damage off of that um anyway i ended up a lap down um even though i was Third in line for the lucky dog. I got a lucky dog on a caution. Was able to capitalize on that and get clear back up to P12. David, DNF. Yeah, and I didn't realize you were that close when I went back and looked at the replay. Um, and Because I did linger really high, which is why, I, uh, even though I was, uh, you know, in the moment kind of shocked, I looked at it and I was like, yep. Yeah. I thought I had two guys right behind me and I, I warned them to go by and man, I guess it was because of how you were on fresh tires and I was on 66 lap old tires that you just closed so fast because I didn't think I was under any pressure to get under. I thought I had let all the guy. I thought I had nothing but clearance behind me. So I did linger too long. Um, so it is what it's been a real where I really threw the race away was I somehow loaded the set that had the three point whatever steering ratio instead of the 1.8 that I usually run. And I just, I could, I could not control the car, especially early. I already had wheel damage just because as I was trying to let people go by on the front stretch, I, I slapped the wall because I'm just not used to that steering ratio. So wrong set is what really happened. And I, I'm sorry that it dinged you up, but you got a decent finish out, out of it. And uh, I, I'll have to be, if I get in that kind of situation again, I got to make sure that I'm aware of everything that's 10 seconds back, not just three seconds back. All right. And then Justin P3. Yeah. Um, you can call me the opposite of Kevin Harvick. I'm definitely not the closer. Uh, I kind of, I stayed up front the whole race. Uh, it really just came down to who had clean air. That was the fastest. Um, I was slow on short runs, fast on long runs, and I just need to learn how to drive green-white checkers. I just I got to flip a switch and turn it into qualifying laps. 
Well, you can overthink those. You know, you're in a position to win. You're like so worked up, you don't want to mess up, and you just screw yourself up. I mean, I used to do that all the time, and I think that comes with experience. You know, you get so many different green white checker starts, you'll you'll start getting more comfortable with it. So, but he hell of a run, Tyler P four. He said, top five, baby, finally recovered some SR and IR as the race stayed green for a while till the end. Felt green to finally have space and race. Competitive with a chance to win. Huge thanks to the team for help with strategy and the pod, fa pod father, Mike, as spotter at the end. Best part was I was car number three, doing it for Dale. And, and Tyler's uh, paint scheme is a uh, tribute to the Dale Earnhardt uh, Wrangler car that's yellow with blue, I think. And, uh, yeah, so he got the, he had the three and well done. Brad, you had P screen fry screen frozen. Yep. So, uh, very optimistic going into last night after the a open race that we had on Tuesday. And, uh, I think I started 12th and like I said earlier, was, was making hay on the outside. Um, I just don't know why guys were, I mean, I understand taking care of your tires, but guys were just really crawling around. So, um, lap 10, you know, I'd probably gain, I don't know, four or five spots and, uh, coming through three and four and right as I'm coming off a of four screen just froze. Um, you know, I turned to the right to, to try to keep it in the wall. Um, but unfortunately I bounced off the wall and came back across track and ended up into the race for, for a couple guys. Um, and I just, I can't stand it when things like that happen. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty clean racer, I think, and I don't really cause ever any issues and, you know, just to hear nothing, but, um, you know, guys saying, Oh, I don't believe that. And he was running too hard and stuff like that. And, um, I don't know. I'll try again tomorrow night. Just, uh, I can't stand it when things out of your control like that, just take you out. So it is what it is. Especially with a newer computer. Um, yikes. Yeah, Kyle Pendigraph, he got a P19. Moving on to today, I ran. I started towards the back but missed a couple big ones with some good luck and skill and drove it up as high as P6 before I hit the wall pretty hard on my own and damaged the car. It was only about 30 seconds, but I had lost my speed and fell back to 13th. And then a longer run ended up doing a green flag stop, and the caution came out shortly after. Wave around, uh, restarting P22 at 19 to go. And then several late cautions, I ended up P15. Justin, you were top split P22. Yeah, yeah, Mike. It was a stout field. Uh, I stayed fit, uh, top 15 the whole race. Uh, like it says on here, I probably had top 10 speed. I was hanging out in the, actually, I was in the top 10, uh, four laps to go. And there was some pretty good drivers running one, two, a Coke guy and another guy. And let's just say they didn't impress me. They kind of just ran each other over that one restart and wrecked the whole field. And that's why I ended up P22. Uh, P1 got loose. Then P2, he's a Coke guy. And he had plenty of time to back off and just kind of ran him. And there went the field. Right. Let's talk other racing. I ran the FIA F4 at Virginia. Qualified 15th. Uh, I spit out on my own a few times, but I got into a few different wrecks and I had a disqualification for too many incident points on lap seven. I was not proud of that. The next start, I qualified 18th. I got to ninth by the end of lap one. On lap five, somebody tries to overtake me and overcooks it spins me out and the guy in front of me and we all die at least he he uh apologized for that so i didn't feel too bad about it but i have not got a finish at virginia this week but man i got to tell you how much i love that track uh, going up through what i call the s's kind of like a back and forth back and forth but you're in this car you're flat out like you know you don't lift at all you just got to try to drive it through the slalom um Anyway, if I can uh, get a finish, uh, I'll be happy. All right, A open, Brad, P3. Yeah, so I ran Tuesday night, uh, A open at Texas. Uh, started 15th, kind of took my time working way to the front. Uh, we ended up with an early yellow, about lap 10. Uh, then we went to a midpoint for the next yellow. Uh, 
right was in the middle of green flag stops. So I was running about, I think about fifth or so guys started pitting and then we ended up with a yellow uh, car was super free on the long run, which was great. Cause everybody else was just complaining about tire wear um, and being tight. Uh, ended up running P4 after uh, pitting with about 20 to go. We had another yellow, uh, again, car stayed pretty neutral, short run, ended up driving back to P3. Uh, Blake Justin kind of messed up a couple things on that short run uh, in hindsight and then learned a few things that I should have tried, you know, that night that I was hoping to use last night. So, um, again, uh, you know, got got speed, just just got to hopefully avoid any screen freezes and uh, hopefully get a, a good, good finish tomorrow night. Yeah, I actually ghosted part of your race um, for practice because um, I had missed the start because I was running that other one. Um, and so I jumped in there to run some laps as a ghost. You know, I really had a hard time with it because I don't think the arrow works right. The, um, the drafting part works right when you're ghosting. Like, I would be, like, up in the cars, like, you know, where I'm superimposed in, inside of them. And then I get right behind them and then I slow back and they're to all go right by me. Like I'm standing still. And so, um, I'm pretty sure that it doesn't allow draft, even though you're in the draft. I don't think I've ever ghosted. So that's interesting. Yeah. I've had the same issue. It's the, the ghosting is broken. I don't think it's broken. I don't think it's probably not a resource they're going to give you, uh, because that's bandwidth being pulled from from the rest of the guys on the server so it's really just not going to be telling them what your position is uh so, so, so with the same kind of uh what's uh same kind of fidelity plus or it, it may just be that because of the fact that you can go straight through the cars they had to disable the draft because it was just causing some weird something weird All right, John, you had some B open, C open. Yeah, I finished up Martinsville last week in, uh, in the B open. You know, Brad said earlier, those races, the B, B races are usually pretty clean, but it's Martinsville, so you never know. Got a P7, 18 cautions, 91 caution laps. Typical Martinsville, pretty awful. You know, that place, you either qualify up front and race or you get wrecked if you don't. And then C open. Uh, what well, was a clean race? We only had 66 caution laps, but got a P12 there. All right. And then I ran, um, I ghosted a uh, dirt micro sprint for the first time ever at Lima Land. Um, I held down the gas all the way down and just steer the car. It actually sounds like a lawnmower kind of. Um, Anyway, I, I decided not to jump in an official race on my first one, but I would ghost an official race just to to try the car and make sure I, I could drive it. I have yet to actually uh, take a, an official start, though, in the car, but uh, pleasantly surprised with how it drove. I was able to drive it. All right, with that, we'll jump to final thoughts. David Hall. Well, I know it's uh, not iRacing related, but the Eclipse was awesome. Um, learned my lesson from 2017 and made sure I was very mobile, had a bunch of stuff set up to where I could basically run away from the clouds, chase the sunshine, right? Didn't end up having to, though. Uh, up Right up near Poplar Bluff the in Missouri, the skies were clear. I was able to actually just stay in my cousin's yard and lay back and watch the sun disappear through my solar filter binoculars and it was awesome. So that was a, a nice experience this weekend and we're not going to see another one for 20 years. So didn't take any pictures either. Everybody likes to take pictures. Something like this, I advise, especially if it's your first time, just kick back and, and enjoy it and let your brain take the pictures. All right. Brad, final thoughts. Um, I don't know. Just, you know, hopefully get a, a good finish at Texas was encouraged after Martinsville, uh, starting to climb back in the standings. And after Tuesday night, he got back over the 3000 mark and I rating. And unfortunately with the screen breeze, that kind of got popped back down, but, um, you know, Texas, I feel good. Uh, don't look forward to Talladega. Just not a, not a fan of drafting tracks. Um, uh, but yeah, 
I don't know. Again, we're just we're in the grind on the uh, in the season. So um, the guys that started have probably started to drop off, and you know now it's it's watching who's around you. Um, you know, one thing I think is it's kind of interesting to do is if you get a minute. You know, if you're if you're in an NIS or if you're if you're if you're running, even if it's a 12 week series, take a look at some of the guys you're racing with and look at the look at the incident counts. I think it's it's pretty telling sometimes when you look at guys and and you, and you see you know what their incident counts are and take take note of that. Um, I know Dave kind of keeps track of stuff through um, Joe real time, but um, you know you can. I know, it's pretty pretty staggering when you can see what your incident count is and you look at guys around you and they're three and four times what yours is so just one of those things to take it take notice of i'm going to warn you though you got to be careful about that because you've seen my incident count right i have i have but i know how you guys race again i'm just saying it's just well you need to divide it by laps but that's true no again i'm just saying it's just it, it's interesting though that's all. Okay. Is I've, I've I've had guys actually try to throw that throw shade at me for that in the past. Actually, say you you got the, you got the most incidents of everybody, and then I went and counted theirs and divided it by the number of laps they raced, and they had more incidents per lap. I've run a lot of laps, so I'm just always right there getting caught up in other people's crap. I know. You're heavy on NIS. That's the he- the longest races out there. So yeah. All right. John, uh, final thoughts. I'm ready to get back to a normal schedule race, and I've been fighting pneumonia for three weeks now, and and uh, I just want to get it over with, man. It's awful, but I want to race at Texas this weekend, get back on, like I say, the normal schedule, and uh, get back in Discord with the group and just, just want normal racing life again. All right. And Justin, final thought. Not much. I got to thank David for being so into this solar eclipse. Uh, I would have never paid no attention to it. And I happened to Google it one day because he's talking about it in chat. And I was like, oh, snap. It goes right through my farm. So me and the family went and watched it. And it was kind of a humbling event. And it was pretty neat. All right. I was good. And then I did say, uh, and I'll repeat now, Justin. You're hot. I mean, you won the last two weeks, Richmond, Martinsville. I'm kind of putting some pressure on you for Texas here to get a turkey. And uh, what do you think? Can you get it? I think if I get in a, obviously, if I get in the right split, I think I can. Um, like I said, it's, it's all about track position and clean air. If you're in clean air and you can somewhat drive, you're going to be the fastest. You got to get to the lead before the end of the race. That's the trick to this. All right, Greg Hectus, you there? No, Greg's out. So I will give my final thoughts. Man, it's good to be back at Texas after those two short tracks and all the cautions and to go into Texas Wednesday night and have this long green flag run and I actually run the freaking tires off of it. And I have my crew chief give me the tire warning. Uh, yeah, that was a new experience that we haven't had in several weeks at iRacing. So uh, it, it kind of feels like we're back to normal if there is such a thing. But uh, man, Talladega is on the horizon. That's my bread and butter, boys. I'm going to get me a win. I feel confident. I, I told you that, you know, before Wednesday night, I don't feel confident about winning at Texas. I might be able to get a good run, but I don't feel like I can win it. But boy, Talladega, I can feel like I feel like I can win it. So, hey, with that, we'll see you on the track later. All right, title ideas. We got two. 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 Okay. Two. Go with two. Wasted away at Martinsville again. Too many L's. Too many Z's. My push to talk is a Z button, so. I Z. Zop it. Thanks for showing, guys. Good show. <laughs> On a roll today. <laughs> All right. Good show, guys. I'll see y'all. See ya.
Peace, homies. I can't get to the download button because of this stupid poll thing. Oh, there we go. Maybe later. <laughs>